Good morning, everybody, and good morning to the folks online. I am Tiffany Edwards. I am the Vice President of Policy and Community Development for the Eugene Area Chamber of Commerce. We are welcoming the candidates for Ward 1 Eugene City Council today. Uh, I'm sorry, Ward 2, I promise I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yes, good one. Good one. Um, she doesn't know where you live. And it does say this in my little note. And so Lisa Warness and Matt Keating and Matt Keating is the current comment. So I'm going to start this morning by thanking each of you for being here with us today. We appreciate it and we are looking forward to hearing from you and your thoughts and your vision for the future of War II. Um, today's forum features both an in-person and a virtual audience. I have to let people in, so I apologize. There's more. Um, they can see us, but we can't see them because they're just tuning in. So, but they've got an owl and they can see everybody there. Um, we're, we're going to record the forums. We've been recording all the forums. We've been using the audio versions because the owl was a little bit funky. So, but the audio versions have been great. Um, our format today, we'll start with each of you having two minutes to introduce yourselves, and then uh, we'll ask a series of questions, which you've had in advance. And then once we get through those questions, we'll open it up to folks both online and here in the room. And Heather, if you have, do you have the cards back there somewhere? Um, the note cards, oh, yeah, right we'll here. get those out. Just if you have a question for candidates, we're gonna have you write it on the card, and then uh, I'll read them off just to keep it consistent. Um, folks online, if you do have a question you want to ask of the candidates, please just type it. I can see the chat and I'll just, um, when we get to that, I can, I can ask your question. Um, we'll, when we move to the questions, you'll each have 60 seconds. Heather back there is going to give you a little 15 second when you've got 15 to go. And then once time is up, there's a, there's another card for that. Um, we just ask that you kind of try to wrap up the, the your, your thought. Uh, but we won't, we won't be, <laughs> we won't give you a hard stop. So um, let's see what else. Um, and we'll wrap up in time to allow you each for uh, two minutes for your clo closing statements as well. So I think that's it here. Any questions? Any questions from the audience? Any questions from the candidates? All right. So we're going to start with Lisa and then we'll rotate who goes first. Um, We'll go ahead and give you your first two minutes. I think, you know, just generally tell us about yourself and why, why you're running for it too. Okay. Um, I'm running because I believe that uh, Eugene is in a very serious crossroads with the House Bill passage, the House Bill 2001. Um, I believe that Eugene moved fast and furious by adopting the full measure that goes well beyond the mandates of the law. And uh, thanks to my opponent, um, that is what the that's what the uh, city council voted to do. So Eugene dropped parking requirements, allows three story buildings in what was single family dwellings, established solar panels and gardens can be threatened. This is a huge mistake and is already causing strife and frustration. Homelessness and lack of affordable housing is an unbearable crisis for residents and businesses. It is time for leadership on a city council that will better represent its constituents and local business interests. Uh, my neighborhood leadership experience, grassroots and business organizational skills is what Eugene needs if we want to keep the spirit um, alive in Eugene and um, homelessness, climate crisis and public safety concerns are all part of why I'm running because I want to um, figure out how to bring all the players to the table that are doing things to better our city like um, like these people healthcare for all and um, other organizations I also want to try to weave the whole thing together so we're not all separate voices I think that we need to bring bring our gr groups that are um, helping us with our needs in our city and our community um, to come together so there's some sort of um, I've just noticed this from going to other meetings it's just that everybody has got this passion to do something for people and I will wrap it up and say that I just want to try to figure out how to get groups together so that we have a bigger voice 
Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Good morning. Um, thank you, LGAP members. Uh, looking forward to many meetings with you in the legislature. Uh, you uh, have visited and lobbied my boss, uh, Senator James Manning. Uh, so I look forward to your legislative priorities and I welcome the newest uh, LGAC members, newest um, uh, chamber uh, staff to the, to the team. My name is Matt Keating. Uh, I'm your Ward 2 City Councilor. Uh, I also serve with Kevin on the KLCC Public Radio Foundation Board. I'm a Eugene Public Library Emeritus Board member and I'm City Council President and lays on to the Lane Regional Air Protection Agency. Um, and I am a past chair of the Human Services Commission, an intergovernmental agency between the cities of Eugene, Springfield, and Lane County, keenly focused on behavioral health, and mental health. In my second term, I'm committed uh, to leverage my relationships and partner with our county and our state to ensure that we have a behavioral health stabilization center. A third option for first responders uh, to, to help, take, uh, to help uh, folks who are suffering an acute mental health crisis. The jail is punitive and overcrowded, and the hospital now across the river is costly. So there needs to be a third option for folks who are suffering uh, uh, from mental health or are suffering from ailments uh, and, and need a pathway to either addiction support services or vital housing support services. And that, to me, clearly, is a day use center, a behavioral health, uh, mental health uh, service center. It's one thing to, to champion affordable housing, which I do. But if we don't give folks the wraparound services and the access and the tools to better themselves, then I question, what are we doing? You can learn more at mattkeating.org. I look forward to a spirited conversation today. And I thank you for your service and your attention. And I thank you for being voters. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to give you the first um, question and then we'll alternate. Um, so hoping you can tell us what you believe is the biggest challenge facing Eugene and how you plan to address it. I, I, I just alluded to it. it the, the homelessness crisis is, is uh, right in front of our face. Uh, and while it may not be in the city's wheelhouse in regards to our charter, the county is the health and human services um, point, it's we have a responsibility as a community. I am the city councilor that advanced an ordinance to ban camping within a thousand feet of the library or of any school in our community. At the same time, in my role as health and human services chair, I protected the funding and stabilized the funding for community supported shelters. We can be compassionate without being enabled. I'm proud of that. We need to find more ways to get resources into our community to help uh, rest stops and help support safe sleep sites. And that means changing the very definition of emergency shelter at a federal level. I've got the energy, the commitment, and the relationships to get that done. But clearly, homelessness is the issue front and center in our community. Yeah, right. So Lisa, same question. What do you believe is the biggest challenge facing Eugene, and how would you plan to address it? Okay, thanks for the question. Um, to reduce homelessness, we must make a concerted effort and a coordinated effort as well. From all agencies, nonprofit groups in the uh, region to efficiently and effectively deploy resources from federal, county, city, and charitable sources. The approach has been used effectively from um, federal. Oh, sorry. This, this approach has been used effectively to reduce long-term homelessness in other cities such as Houston, Texas. Reports from Portland and Multnomah County indicate that we do need to do a better job tracking and monitoring of our homeless population to understand what works and what does not work. So that's where I would start. Thank you. So I'll give you the, uh, the next question to take first. Uh, so the Chamber's mission is for a strong, a strong and vibrant economy, which enables individuals to live happy, healthy lives. What do you think businesses need for a strong local economy? And what do you feel the role of the city council member is in supporting local businesses? Okay. Well, as a small business owner, I understand the challenges of lo that local businesses face, and we must ensure that local Eugene local businesses and small businesses can operate in a fair and level environment. 
It's not favoring large out of town businesses. Eugene's business is proper, prosper when Eugene's residents do well and enjoy a quality environment and a quality neighborhood with good schools. Investments in Eugene neighborhoods, infrastructure, and schools are a great way to support our local businesses. You good? <laughs> You're good. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, um, that that's basically in a nutshell. There's so much more that yeah. I can do. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll move to Matt. Um, I'll repeat the question. So the Chamber's mission is to support a strong, vibrant economy, which enables individuals to live happy, healthy lives. What do you think the businesses need for a strong local economy? And what do you feel is the role of like, the city council? I would answer this in a Socratic method, uh, manner. Thanks, Tiffany. I would ask those who are doing the work what you need. And having that open door conversation is critical. I applaud the mayor for creating a blue ribbon commission that brought business to the table uh, as we tackle climate change, as we tackle homelessness, um, as we are coming out of the, the pandemic and, and look to infuse uh, energy into our community, economic energy into our community and attract new business into our community. Eugene's a great place to live, work and play. It needs to be a better place to live, work, play and stay. And that means hiring local, it means providing living wage jobs, means providing workforce housing, um, all of the above. But I would ask the chamber and I would ask Elgat in particular what your needs are in that Blue Ribbon Panel Commission. I want to see that long term ongoing, not necessarily as an official board or commission, but as a committee that actually works, gets the job done and uh, informs council what your needs are. Great. All right, I'll give you this next one first. Um, Eugene's crisis around housing affordability, supply, and diversity of housing types has had a dire impact to this city. What strategies to improve these would you support, and what new ideas might you have to bring to the role as a city councilor? Thank you. I'll start with the, the new ideas. You may have heard me crow about it from the dais, but we have um, an urban renewal district, downtown and the uh, riverfront urban renewal district. I'm a champion for third urban renewal district going out 6th and 7th and out Highway 99. When folks come and visit our community, uh, friends or family or business leaders, and they, they, get off, they get out of the airport and they come into that 99 corridor, ask yourselves, are they seeing the best of what Eugene offers? So infusing economic activity on that corridor, building up and not out. I'm the only counselor who's fundamentally uh, voted against uh, expanding our urban reserves. I want to protect our forests to the south and our farmland to the north, and I want to build up responsibly. We can do it, Eugene. Three, four, or five stories of commercial on the bottom and residential on the way up along parts of our community that are just, that are blighted and, and lacking serious investment and in economic energy. I look forward to a third urban renewal district uh, coming to fruition in my second term. Okay, great. It's the same question. Our crisis around uh, housing affordability, supply, and diversity of housing types have had a dire impact to businesses. What strategies to improve these would you support? And what new ideas could you bring to the role as a city councilor? Uh, I believe that uh, people, uh, businesses and people do better when they have extra money to spend. And as far as affordable housing goes, $2,500 a month for rent is not affordable. We must get rent in line with the reality of people's incomes first. We must have a healthy rate ratio of new housing to be truly affordable while preserving existing housing. We should raise the minimum wage. We should provide more education and training for skills, skilled blue collar jobs. If we are to expect affordable housing at the current price, Thanks for the question. You got it. All right. We have uh, another question. And Lisa, we'll start with you first. Okay. All right. Watching Heather back there. That's okay. okay. <laughs> uh, so many of our Eugene Chamber members have expressed concerns that improving downtown is a top priority for their businesses. What do you think needs to be improved downtown and how would you work to make that happen? I've lived in Eugene for 44 years and I've watched the city open streets and I've watched them close the streets only to open back up again. 
we should ask our taxpayers, what do they want to support downtown? And I know some of our uh, taxpayers are business owners downtown. So let's engage the public. And that's what I want to do as city councilor is bring back citizen involvement. We could and uh, engage the public about what's coming with everything that the fallout from House Bill 2001 and truly affordable housing being part of the mix into the neighborhoods that are now slated in development is already going on. The uh, fact that the city drop parking restrictions is appalling to me. And uh, I, I, we're, we are looking at some serious fallout here in the future. So I'm concerned about not just downtown. I am concerned about all of the areas that are being targeted for these uh, stack attacks that are coming our way. Thank you for the question. Okay. And I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, our members have expressed uh, improving downtown being a top priority for businesses. Um, what do you think needs to be improved and, and how would you work to make that happen? Thank you. Uh, but giving law enforcement the tools to do their job downtown, to keep downtown safe and open. Um, most recently, uh, I was the swing vote that advanced a whole suite of, uh, of parking, uh, restrictions, uh, kind of clamping down on the, 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 the frequent breaking bad style campers. Um, um, you know, we hadn't, we as council hadn't adjusted the parking, uh, ordinance was a $25 ticket since the 1980s. So that's changed. Uh, moreover, if one gets a ticket, three times within a 90 day period, they are now subject to. Uh, so there, there's there's some uh, some teeth uh, uh, in regards to what we've recently done for parking. Um, but keeping downtown open, vibrant and clean, um, ensuring that there, there's economic energy and activity downtown, ensuring folks have pathways to home ownership downtown, um, and that there are rentals available that are affordable downtown. Um, I. <laughs> I'm going to do a second round, Mayor. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, maybe you can weave it into the second round. <laughs> um, all right. So I'll let you take the first, the, be first in taking this next question. Investments in economic development opportunities are a powerful tool that the city has in leveraging public dollars to attract private investment. Maybe lobbying you a little bit here. Mm -hmm. This in turn helps to create jobs, boost economic activity, and ultimately bring in new tax revenues to support the city's general fund. How would you prioritize projects and opportunities that support economic vibrancy? Thank you. I'm the city councilor that, uh, with uh, Lisa Fraga, uh, who's running for House District 8 on the Lane Community College Board, a board Kevin knows well, crafted the community benefits agreement uh, that ensures that on uh, projects with public dollars, that we keep our dollars local and hired locally, uh, that we have locally sourced sustainably goods, and we're lifting up minority owned businesses. Um, I would like to see, uh, obviously there's there's you know procure, uh, statewide procurement dollars for public projects, but I would like to see, and I just uh, floated this most recently at a work session, um, I would like to see a citywide CBA or PLA, a project labor agreement or a community benefits agreement uh, at a municipal level uh, that, that embraces the concept of public-private partnerships and ensures that we are hiring locally and we're lifting up uh, local businesses and using sustainably sourced uh, goods within 100 mile radius or you know, whatever makes sense for, for our community. But I would use the model that we crafted at LCC uh, and, and look to the state uh, the, uh, a model that my my boss Senator Manning crafted back in 2021, and and look to the county former county commissioner uh, crafted back in 2019. Uh, there are models that can be employed and embraced in the city. Certainly needs uh, a, a CBA or community benefits agreement. Lisa, I'll ask the same question. Uh, investments in the economic development opportunities are a powerful tool that the city has in leveraging public dollars to attract private investment. This in turn helps create jobs, boost economic activity, and ultimately bring in new tax revenues to support the city's general fund. How do you prior, how would you prioritize projects and opportunities that support economic vibrancy? At this point, with uh, Eugene being listed as number six as desirable cities to live in, I believe 
Um, we must revisit the 10 year tax incentives that we're giving to out of town developers. I'm all for giving them two years. I think that's reasonable while they get the thing built up and built out. Um, but let's face it, Eugene needs to invest in the community. It it's high time we you know invested in our in our community essential public service services, public safety, including mental health and drug addiction programs. These <clears throat> programs will help lead to solutions of homelessness. We will. I also want to. Uh, ex I will extend the use of MUPTI where there is true affordable housing involved, and um, I I believe that. Um, I believe that investment back into our community is what we really need to do. We have not been doing that for the last oh, citizen involvement has been dying a slow death for 20 years. And that's something I want to really bring back to form the growth of how we move forward in growing in Eugene so that we grow smart and we grow in a humane way so that we don't just kick our longtime residents to the curb. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to go to question number six. Um, and I will start with Lisa. How will you involve the voice of business in the decision making process for issues that affect our community to ensure that the city's regulatory policies are practical and effective? As I stated before, I plan to bring back open and transparent governing. This will be a meaningful tool for both business and residents. I will stay apprised of the city's regulatory policies and make sure they are up to date and effective. And let me add, fair. Thanks for the question. That same question, how will you involve the voice of business in the decision-making process for issues that affect our community to ensure that the city's regulatory policies are practical and effective? City councilors need to come to LCAP. Uh, um, I'm an open, I have an open door policy and I uh, make my phone number 541-515-3819 uh, most public. I'm a phone call or text away. When Brittany or Tiffany or John call or text, I answer. Um, and so I want to hear from you, uh, our newest staff members. Let's get coffee, cold brew, uh, <laughs> and, and let's talk digital advertising. Um, I want to, you know, I, I want to make the time and the space to hear your interests, but I danced around it earlier and alluded to the Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, I want to see that long term. I want to see uh, our next mayor, Karen Knudsen, have the flexibility to meet with LGAC and to meet with business leaders. Um, but, and, and as a member of council leadership, I hope to be part of those conversations, but you're always going to get uh, a, a, a response and an open door policy, 541. 515-3819. Thank you. All right, I got another question here. Matt, I'll start with you. What, you've touched on this a little bit um, with your with um, recent parking um, ordinance, but I wanted, what strategies or measures would you consider to enhance public safety in our neighborhoods and our business areas? Mm. More vibrant activities. Uh, in our parks, in our uh, community centers, tend to offer self-policing. If there's activity, then, then uh, by definition, uh, then the spaces are more safe. But I would also uh, point to, or I would also bring our law enforcement partners, uh, both uh, have endorsed my campaign, the Eugene Police Employees Association, and the lane professional firefighters, local 851, I would bring our first responders to the table and ask what their needs and concerns are. Um, you know, it, it, I don't pretend to have all the answers, Tiffany, but I would, uh, I, I welcome your input. Um, and fundamentally, uh, I think a vibrant community is a healthy and safe community. So I would want to see more activity, uh, not just downtown, but throughout our parks, uh, park systems in our neighborhoods. Okay. Lisa, same question. What strategies or measures will you consider to enhance public safety in our neighborhoods and business areas? Thanks for the question. Um, safety in our neighborhoods has been eroding quickly. 
from speeding drivers to property theft or personal safety, and most of us are feeling this in some way. I support the police and other first responders, and I will work to ensure adequate funding and coordination of other public safety um, measures are taken to, to help. Um, and I think also addressing why, I mean, a lot of these people are homeless people that are causing the, the crime and getting those people in houses and affordable houses and low income houses will will solve a lot of the crime. Guaranteed. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Lisa, starting with you, what is your long term vision for Eugene? And how will you ensure that your decisions <laughs> provide a vibrant, sustainable community for future generations? Thanks for the question. I uh, plan to bring all of the stakeholders to the table for some planning. Wait a minute. That was the long-term vision, right? <laughs> yes, long-term okay. vision. Okay, okay. I plan to bring all of the stakeholders to the table for sane planning that does not destroy the livability of our neighborhoods. While accommodating for growth, we must make way for it. Our growth planning must be in line with carbon neutral by 2050. Only then we can make a goal, the goal of being carbon neutral by then. I see the current trajectory of what is going on in the planning that is not actually affordable housing. Ones that I've been looking at, um, it, they just seem to be, uh, like they could be much better planned. I feel like that we we need to really try much harder to be to take the citizens that live here and have supported this community for four, you know four decades or more. That we need to uh, not just cram a three story building right next to them and give them an additional 20, 30 cars parked in front of their house because that's what it's looking like. So I want to I want to put some sanity back in that plan. Thank you. Got it. All right. Matt, what is your long-term vision for Eugene? How will you ensure that your decisions provide a vibrant, sustainable community for future generations? Our long-term vision for Eugene is a great place to live, work, play, and stay. It's a beautiful, vibrant community. The secret's out. It's a wonderful place to raise a family. And I want to see our community grow. Uh, grow up and not out. I want to protect our forests to the south and our farmland to the north. I want to see an array of housing uh, at all levels. So when businesses come, there's workforce housing available. There's affordable housing. There's federally subsidized housing. There's market rate housing. Uh, there's a whole suite of options for folks to buy in and 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 stay in this community. Becca and I uh, love Eugene. My life, Becca. Uh, you love Eugene, or you wouldn't be here. And so together, I would like to see us collaborate. I'd like to see us embrace a shared vision of economic prosperity. And I would like us to... Um, I'm going to need another second round, Tiffany. And I'd like us to work together collaboratively to solve the issues in front of us that range from houselessness, to the climate crisis, and looking at investments of housing at all income levels. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave who you, well, I love Eugene, and I, I want to see us uh, be a stronger community, a healthier community, and a community that's welcoming, and a community that's safe. Last question I have, so probably we'll be thinking of something, and got a couple already. <clears throat> if elected or re-elected in your case, how will you measure a successful term, second term in your case, as Ward 2 City Council? I'll start by measuring the success of my first term. I'm the city councilor that, uh, that saved Green Hill Humane Society's fund when it was tenuous. About an 8% uh, budget cut was facing Green Hill, and I found a way to collaborate with city staff, uh, law enforcement, 
uh, to essentially move 911 operators under the community safety initiative, freeing up nearly half a million dollars for Green Hill Humane Society. It's a win. <clears throat> Love me or hate me for it. I'm the city councilor that advanced a fireworks ban in the South Hills to protect our community from wildfire danger. And I banded together with my colleagues to help prevent critical cuts to a local fire station, fire station number eight. Firefighters, lane professional firefighters, local 851 have endorsed my campaign. Congressman Peter DeFazio, Congresswoman Val Hoyle, Governor Tina Kotek, most recently Eugene Weekly, Representative Paul Holby, Senators Krasonsky and Manning, and I would say, and Mayor Venice and Councilors Ye, Groves, uh, Zelenka, and, and Leach. That's a measure of success. Lisa, if elected, how would you measure a successful term as a Ward 2 City Council? Um, success after a first term would, would be less homeless people on the street um, because they're living in affordable housing and more uh, funding for schools, mental health programs, along with drug addiction treatment programs without raising property taxes. By investing in the community, the status quo of giving long-term breaks needs to stop. I will have citizen involvement program in place, and there will be more transparency in the local government. And I do want to mention that Green Hill, back, oh, I don't remember what year, was privatized. Uh, Lane County Animal Services was privatized, and uh, then it was taken over by Green Hill. I used to do dog rescue for 10 years with Save the Pets, and uh, we pretty much had Lane County Animal Service as a no-kill shelter, pretty much. Green Hill is a kill shelter. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have a couple questions here. I've got one in the chat. Um, I'll just kind of go in order here. So first question, and Lisa, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to go first. Um, we hear negative sentiments from the current local from the current city council about local businesses which are owned or headquartered outside of the region just happens we also have heard that current city council shares statements about building a local community and economy which is able to attract outside businesses to relocate here what's your perspective on these views and how do how do you think they kind of relate to one another Can you rephrase that a little yeah. bit? I'm not quite understanding. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it. here. So we hear <laughs> we hear negative sentiments about out businesses that are lo located here that are headquartered somewhere else. At the same time, we're also talking about recruiting businesses to come here. Mm -hmm. And so maybe just can you maybe speak to that? And what's your perspective on that, uh, on your views? Related to local businesses or businesses that aren't yet local, but we want to recruit. Correct. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, now I get it. Okay, so I think that um, depending on what the outside business is, I mean, damn, if it's something that we really need, you know, that's going to really help our community and our uh, our population here in Eugene and be a service to us, I, I'm not going to turn away. I mean, I don't even see how you can turn away business. I don't like it, on the other hand, don't like how Corporate has taken over everything, and that I'm not in favor of at all. In fact, you know, with this healthcare for all, you know, I the, the way that the medicine has been so corporate, you know, incorporated that people are not getting good health care, you know, and that's another thing I want to deal with. So I think it has to be case by case, really. You know, what's going to be best for Eugene? That's my bottom line. Matt, do you want me to try to articulate the question again? Okay, <laughs> so we hear we hear sentiments. There's a lot of um, sentiments from city council and, and otherwise that um, there's a, a there's a we hear negative things about businesses who have uh, who are headquartered elsewhere. That we may have here. Yeah. Probably think of a full handful, but at the same time, we are actively looking to recruit businesses yeah. from outside the area. And so what are you, what's your perspective on these views and kind of, you know, how do they relate to one another? So let's, let's use an example, Lowe's versus Jerry's. 
a national okay. uh, company versus uh, an Oregon sure. homegrown company. I suspect there are investors who live in Eugene who invest in Lowe's. I suspect Lowe's hires a local workforce. I suspect Jerry's hires a local workforce. A balance is, is, is welcome. I'm not going to sit back and pick winners and, and losers. I'm going to do what I can as a counselor to attract responsible business to the community while working with our current uh, business leaders to find ways that, to keep business working for them. Um, you know, if, 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 if Salem is more attractive or if, if, if Portland is more attractive or Ashland or Bend and we're losing out on opportunities, we're losing out on, on long-term residents, we're losing out on growing our tax base, we're losing out on vibrant economic activity. So I would want to strike a balance. And I hope that that example uh, is, is a fair one. I, I uh, mentioned earlier my enthusiasm and thirst for community benefits agreement. I would hope that there would be living wage jobs attached uh, to, uh, to businesses that, that we attract. Um, but it's not council's role to, to pick winners and losers. It's our role to establish a, uh, a, a ordinances and laws that work for all and, uh, um, and, and get out of the way to attract the, the right, uh, to attract responsible businesses to, to our community. But we can't just be homegrown and we can't just be out of state. So there's a, but there's a balance, Tiffany. Yeah. I'll let you start, let you answer this one first. Um, you talked about, a lot about building up and not out. So, what do you? What are the obstacles that you perceive to building up? Yeah. And how might you propose to? So it has to pencil out. I look at ten fifty nine Willamette, um, the, the old downtown LCC building, the old Montgomery Ward building, perfectly positioned on a transit line. Finally, we were able to find the right developer to responsibly work. Uh, 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 to raise the the, 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 the the building and and build up that is commercial on the bottom, residential on the way up, 130 units. 70 of those units are going to be affordable housing units, federally subsidized. 60 of those are going to be market rates, so it pencils out. 10 units are going to be dedicated for the Hope and Safety Alliance, formerly Women's Space. So survivors of domestic violence can have a safe space to be. That's a win-win. That's, that's commercial on the bottom. That's a, a residential on the way up it's mixed economy and mixed housing and it's right on a transit line and we're partnering with a reputable nonprofit. that's what i want to see replicated throughout this community so you have thoughts on that what, what do you see as the obstacles you may perceive to building up and in, in, instead of out um and might how might you overcome those that is a very very tough planning mm -hmm. issue um, I understand why we have to go up. I'm totally 100% in agreement that we need to do that because I don't want to break out the urban growth boundary and I definitely don't want to break it out over for a one-time grab all either. And I think that, that was something that uh, Tina Kotek was talking about at some point. But uh, I, I also think that we need to go up. It's just how are we going to go up? Are we going to invade the neighbor's privacy so badly that they're going to sell their house and leave. That's what's happening in the areas where this is happening. And I guess, you know, I know that I'm because I've talked to people that work in a city and their attitude is, this is just the way it is. And people need to just move over and accept it. That is heartless when you have people that have lived here for decades and they've supported this city through hard times. And now the city, this city is number six and an awesome city, which it won't be for long in the current trajectory we're headed. Um, I, I believe, I'll stop, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, well, I'll change gears a little bit now okay. to the question about um, homeless, homelessness. So there is a common narrative out there that uh, most folks who are experiencing homelessness are from here. There are from local folks that are experiencing, you know, that have come, to, come into hard times. However, if you listen to our first responders, they tell a different story. First responders will say that most of the people that they come in contact with are not from here. What are your thoughts about that? Both of you, but yeah, we'll start with you. Okay. 
Well, personally, when I started this campaign, I started walking around to homeless encampments all over town. And 80% of the responses I got when I asked them, where are you from? They were from some other state. And I got, when I mentioned that publicly, wow, did I ever get pushed back. Why did I get pushed back? I don't know. But there's a lot of people, a lot more people here in town than there was two years ago. That you can tell by the traffic, uh, by all of the tents on the street. Yeah, I mean, it is a huge issue. And a lot of those people are not from here because we have services and that's why they're coming. Matt, I'm going to re read the question again and give you the opportunity. So it's a common narrative out there that, that folks who are experiencing homelessness are from here. However, if you listen to some of our first responders, they tell a different story. First responders <laughs> say that most of the people they come in contact with are not from here. What are your thoughts about that? We're all from somewhere. <laughs> if you laugh, but no, I mean, uh, it was, I, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. but but even my opponent moved here from somewhere else. In California, you moved here from the Bay Area. And so whether it's you moved here 44 years ago, or you moved here four years ago, or you moved here four months ago, you're part of our community. Nightingale Rest Stop on 34th and Hilliard boasts a 70% rehoming rate. I want to find ways to support and not demonize. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, next question, I'll let you start. We have a first class university here that produces stories of talented and in industrious graduates. What ideas do you have to inspire or incentivize keeping them in our community versus having them head out to other communities? Thanks. Um, talk about live, work, play, and Eugene needs to be a better place to live, work, play, and stay. And perhaps that means providing incentives or tax relief for local businesses who hire local graduates. So around 80% of Lane graduates, these are 2008 numbers back when I helped pass the, the bond. So forgive me if these are off, but about 80% of Lane graduates stay. It's less than 50% of UO graduates stay. So why are they not staying? Is there lack of, of employment? Is there lack of housing? Let's find out and let's, let's work to, to correct that. Um, I suspect it's... Uh, both. So let's attract businesses and let's provide workforce housing and let's provide housing that folks, uh, that new graduates can, can, can buy into. Going back to that previous question um, ever, ever so briefly, we do a point in time count in January to our with our unhoused population. A point in time count in January is largely not indicative of what the actual uh, amount of, of residents or community members who are unhoused. I would wanna work with our federal partners to change when our point in time counts are so we can get a better handle on how to actually deliver services, get folks connected to affordable housing and get them the wraparound services and support that they need to stay housed. Lisa, I'm gonna reread this question now that I've realized I read a word wrong. Uh, so, but it, it's the gist. So we have a first class university here scores of talented and industrious what ideas do you have to inspire or incentivize keeping them in our community versus having them head off to other states and other states well with the exception of Justin Herbert he had to go move to California because he's a you know born born a charger fan you know and he's an awesome player but in general, I believe that we need to have jobs here that are available to our graduates. We don't. And the other thing that uh, ties into that is living here costs a lot of money. This is a very expensive place to live. And so I think that's one of the reasons why these young graduates leave too. Plus, maybe they just want to go find their own life elsewhere. I don't really know. I agree with you. We need to identify why people are leaving. And um, that would be the first thing I would do. But I know we don't have enough jobs that are in related to the degrees that they're coming out of school with. So thanks for the question. You got it. So I've got another question that's, re that's related. So I'm going to ask this one here online. Um, improving wages is a goal 
to each of you. Um, what? How do you expect businesses to pay that? And and will there be federal outreach to help local businesses be successful? So tying it to kind of like wage things like that. So how? What's maybe talk a little bit more about like how do we do that? So Lisa, I'll let you take this one first. So improving wages is important to you. How um, how would you propose that businesses? cover that cost? And is there any kind of federal outreach to help local businesses be successful? Well, identifying those uh, programs would be the first thing to do to see if there's any kind of fiscal help there. Otherwise, um, I believe, again, well, specifically the question again. Well, let's see, I'm trying to paraphrase a little bit here. So improving wages is a goal for each of oh, yeah, yeah. How do you expect businesses to, co to compensate or to cover that? Well, you know, the way that it always works is when you give a person a raise, you know, you make the hamburger go up uh, 50 cents or something. I, I And I know that that is not a sustainable way to deal with giving um you know, raising the minimum wage. And I do believe we need to raise the minimum wage to, you know, 18 bucks an hour minimum. It's it's um, it's um really hard to employ people, especially when they have degrees and you they start out at $18 an hour. And that's what I think the minimum wage should be. So across the board, wages need to go up. So that means the employer needs to figure out how to pay. And I know it's difficult. There's no easy answer. Prices will just go up, or if there's a way to in incentivize whatever that particular business <clears throat> might be. All just many things to be looking at. And I don't have answers right now, but I'm certainly willing to dive into it and figure out what possibilities are. I'm a problem solver. So I have been in my business for 25 years of nothing but problems in, con in construction. <laughs> So, okay. Thank you. We'll go. You, thank you, Matt. I'm going to ask you the same question. Kind of fumble here. Um, so, improving wages is, is is a goal important. Um, how do you expect that businesses can bridge that gap and cover that increase? Um, and how, you know, what what how, how do you do that? First of all, I'll you lead by example. I was the first among the first elected officials in Lane County back when I first ran for the LCC board in 2013 to pay my staff a minimum wage. What I thought should be a minimum wage, actually, $15 an hour back in 2013. So you pay your staff and lead by example um, appropriately. Uh, I think that, and I, I mentioned this earlier, um, that there, there should be incentives uh, or tax breaks for local businesses who hire local graduates. We also should be looking to higher ed, LCC uh, in particular, about how to get folks across that finish line to complete that degree. Maybe there should be incentives for uh, businesses who send folks back to school to learn a second language. But those incentives can and should come with collaboration from the state and, and the federal government. Um, I've got the relationships uh, uh, to, to help make those connections. I'm endorsed by Congress, former Congressman Peter DeFazio, Congresswoman Val Hoyle in particular, uh, Governor Tina Kotek, Governor Kotek. Um, and and I, I, I turned to higher ed for some of the, the answers there. Uh, I turned to LGAC and I turned to the chamber uh, for, for how to find ways uh, to, to, to lift uh, the wages, which lifts the wages for an entire uh, workforce. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I'll be asking more questions and giving answers. But I appreciate the, the question, and I do want to say it goes back to leading by example, and I'm proud to be among the first elected officials to hire or to, to pay my staff uh, what I thought should be a living wage at the time, uh, $15 an hour in 2013. Thank you. Got one last question, unless there's any other floating around out there or folks online want to chime in. Um, okay. I'm going to ask this question. Do you support or oppose the two local city ballot measures, M Stadium funding, star voting for local offices? Just answer that and tell us a little bit why. Yes and no. Uh, so yes, as council president, uh, it was important for me 
to uh, give Eugene voters the opportunity to weigh in on a multi-use facility, which I find to uh, be potentially a boon to the economy around the fairgrounds. Uh, I wanna see cranes in the air and living wage jobs supported. Um, I um, applaud the, the, uh, the piece about uh, public safety and, and potential training and respite in, uh, in case of an emergency. And fundamentally, the M's uh, have been in our community longer than the Giants have been in San Francisco or the Dodgers have been in LA. They're a storied organization that has lifted up uh, a multitude of nonprofits. So I'm a yes, and uh, I think it's important, regardless of where you fall on the spectrum uh, as council leadership, that we give uh, the community an opportunity to weigh in in regards to uh, the confusing voting measure. Um, no, that uh, would drive, uh, that, that would potentially send multiple ballots to the electorate. It is costly. Uh, Lane County's done an FAQ if you would like to read more about how uh, significantly uh, or how cost burdensome it is to administer. Uh, and I ask, with a state that has the highest voter turnout in a primary in the nation, what are we trying to fix with a confusing and costly uh, uh, proposal. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, a, a no on on, uh, on that particular measure. Perfect. And <clears throat> shameless plug, we are having that presentation here the next week. So give people an opportunity to understand what it's about. Um, Lisa, I'm going to ask you the same question about those two local ballot measures. Um, do you support uh, both? You support or oppose the M Stadium and star voting, and maybe just kind of give us a little bit of why. I'll be the opposite of, of uh, Matt over here. Mm -hmm. I um, I uh, do not support a hundred million dollar uh, stadium. For one, it should not be paid for by the taxpayers. It, it's there's no. I don't really believe that we'll get that great of a kickback for all of the uh, um, events that we have there. Not and, and, can, and also considering the extra traffic we would bring there, we need to do something to deal with our traffic rather than c continue adding to the problem. And also, just the, it is to me, it just it seems really it galls me that that the that this that we would even ask. Our citizens to do that to to pay for that when we don't have mental health programs when we don't have services when we are being asked to raise our taxes to keep schools open I think it is just absurd and as far as um, star voting is straightforward it is implemented already we do not have to retool it it is not expensive because it's already available to us it's already implemented. We just have to start using it. I think that ranked choice has really confused, or they've made it, the opponents to star voting have made it sound really confusing and it is not when you just look at the images. So, and ranked choice, we have to retool that thing. It will not be cheap. So I'm opposed to ranked choice. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, a, I'm supporting star. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to let, um, our chair, maybe something unconventional, would like to ask a question from the floor, but I trust you. Thanks. <laughs> and thanks for coming. Uh, as you know, there's a myriad of ballot measures as far as bonds, levies, all types of things. The city is in a is at a financial situation where they're strapped. Both of you have, have aspired many programs that cost a lot of money. Housing incentives, business incentives, uh, mental health incentives. Being as taxed as we are as homeowners and business owners, what programs would you be willing to cut to make some of the priorities that you want to move forward. Which one? 
Go ahead. I mentioned it before. I mean, we're giving billions of dollars away over decades to the developers. And I think, you know, back in the beginning, it, because Eugene, people really didn't want to come here. And so I, I could kind of understand it. But now, I don't think so. So I think that there's a lot of money that we could tap into if we just change how we do things and if we invest more in our community, because we really need to invest in our community. There's just a lot of misery out there right now. I've been walking around door to door for two months now. People are sick to death and thinking about having to leave their homes because their property taxes are too high. So we have to figure out how to give back some of that money to our community, and that's how I would do it. I want to protect those vital services, John. Um, and I long to grow the revenue pie, not cut into said vital services. And that's why I enthusiastically supported uh, the creation of a revenue committee or a revenue team. Uh, and I've floated a, a series of concepts uh, that may put me on Bigfoot Beverages hit list. I recognize that. But a soda tax that would put dollars toward health and human services is desperately needed. We have a cannabis alcohol tobacco uh, and gasoline sales tax already, but a tax on carbonated uh, high fructose uh, corn syrup uh, beverages, people are still gonna pay nine bucks pop, pun totally intended at, at Autzen Stadium. I am enthusiastic about a vacancy tax, looking at British Columbia uh, in, in, in Vancouver in, in particular. If there are homes or, or there's property that's blighted and not being used to generate economic activity, whether it's commercial or residential, let's let's apply a vacancy tax and generate real revenue with affordable housing trust funds. So I'm in the camp of growing the revenue stream without going back to the property tax owners and protecting and preserving our vital programs. Okay. Last call for any other questions. Otherwise, we will move to our closing statements. Matt, we'll start with you. And then end with Lisa. So the floor is yours. Tell us everything you want to tell us in two minutes. <laughs> well, I, 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 you can learn more at mattkeating.org, uh, but it, it is a pleasure to be with you this morning and have this conversation. It is an extreme honor to, to serve. Uh, I'm the product of, uh, of greatest generation Americans. My granddad served in World War II uh, in the Pacific arena, one in the Army and one in the Navy. My maternal grandmother was an educator. And my grandparents lived within a mile of, uh, of, of my uh, folks' house um, and, and helped provide that nurturing experience or that nurture, help provide hands-on familial connection. I want to find ways to keep our families together <clears throat> here in Eugene. And that's why I've supported uh, ADUs or mother-in-law cottages. That's why I continue to support affordable pathways to home ownership, whether it be condos or apartments um, or, 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 or allowing folks the ability to, to scale down uh, and, 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 and stay in our community. So keeping families together and embracing the concept that Eugene is a great place to live, work, and play and needs to be a better place to live, work, play, and stay. I'm endorsed by the Eugene Weekly, Governor Tina Kotek, Congressman Peter DeFazio, Congresswoman Val Hoyle, our first responders, the Lane Professional Firefighters, Eugene Police Associate, Eugene Police Employee Association, the Sierra Club, the Oregon League of Conservation Voters. From carpenters to educators to neighbors, folks are standing united. Uh, our county commissioners, Heather Buck, Lori Trieger, former Commissioner Pete Sorensen, my city council colleagues, they're standing united behind my reelection because I get stuff done. Around the corner, I want to see investments at at the federal and state, county and local level for the erection of a behavioral health, mental health stabilization center. Thank you for the time. Learn more at mattkeating.org. And in just 13 short days, Oregon voters, please be sure to cast your vote by May 21. Thank you. Thank you for the plug. And Lisa, the floor is yours. <clears throat> well. I, um, I've been in uh, Eugene since um, 1980. 
And I moved here to uh, get away from the urban sprawl that was happening in the Bay Area. I actually lived in Santa Cruz at the time, but it was becoming quite gentrified. It broke my heart to watch it, so I moved up here because I love the trees um, and just how gorgeous it is up here. And uh, it's changing rapidly. And I um, I feel like I, I've done some service to the community in that I stopped development in the Amazon headwaters so that we have some beautiful parkland to go to hike around in and co connectivity to the Ridgeline Trail system. And um, I, I definitely plan on making sure that we have incentivized developers that are already building affordable housing that are part of what we are doing here in our planning. And I also want to make sure that we do a mindful planning so that we're not invading people's privacy 100%. I mean, we have to work with our citizens. We have to plan with the citizens. It's just not right to just say, move the heck over. We're going to do this. We don't care. Move whatever you got to do. So you move and then they tear that house down. That's just I see that that's probably what's going to end up happening. Or people are just not going to be able to handle the current trajectory of the development going on around them. And I see that a lot of strife and unhappiness to longtime citizens here. And so that is what I'm mostly concerned about right at this moment. And I feel that we need to just get transparency back in the city government. Uh, and I believe that the planning commission has taken too much power away from the city council. And I want to bring that in because as a person who served on the planning commission, I saw that it basically was serving interests for development and real estate and all of the people that are all of the big names that um, my opponent is, is thumping are all supported by the Eugene Realtors Pact. That's alarming to me because while I realize we must grow, I also realize we must grow in a thoughtful way. I don't think we're that far apart in terms of, of that either, but it's just certain things along the way we have to make decisions that will represent our citizens and affordable housing. That's it. Getting homeless people off the street into affordable housing. Thank you very much for all you coming here at any time. And I uh, invite you to uh, my website, warnersforcouncil.org. See more about me. Um, you can go to my Facebook and um, see what I'm like really as a human being. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa Warnes and Matt Keating. Uh, as a reminder, I just want to let folks know we're going to be posting all of these uh, forums, and so we just put it out there. And um, we also have our voters' guide out, so that a lot of great compliments on that. Um, things been fantastic in putting that together, and I really highly encourage everybody to check that out. Um, I'll leave you with a thought because I had the opportunity to go to um, Washington D.C. last week, and I was there with. The Portland Metro and the Seattle Chambers of Commerce and 150 businesses, elected officials, you name it. Out, and then there's me, little, little me from Green. We had a speaker and she was with the Brookings Institute and she gave the most fantastic presentation I've ever seen, but she was such a great speaker. But she, she said something that resonated with me and I'm sharing this because um, what she said in talking about how to improve our downtowns because it's across the nation a problem for downtowns. And she said, you've got to make doing the right thing easier than doing the wrong thing. And it was brilliant to me. And so I just want to say, you know, because when you think about policymakers and the choices that we're making, and if you're if it's if it's the same, if all else equal, doing the wrong thing is the same as is doing the right thing, you might you're going to see the outcomes we don't want. So I just thought that, that was brilliant. So I'm going to take that opportunity to to make that fun. So thank you all, and we'll see you next week for star voting, and then we'll be done with our election season. Pretty exciting. So thank you guys. All right. Hi, wife. Yeah.